Our listener's question is as follow. Have you ever done a podcast about BIM? BIM, for, for those who don't know, means building information model, right? Um, and its impact on architecture. Full disclosure, I am a BIM manager who started my career as a traditional architect would. I often feel that I believe in BIM and its benefits for doing complex work, but also how it's kind of ruining the industry. Would love to hear more about your perspective. I know that we've talked about BIM before in the podcast in a positive way. I know we've talked about its negatives kind of sprinkled throughout different episodes, yeah. but maybe this is a chance, an opportunity to talk about it more holistically and thoroughly in one recording. First of all, for people who don't know what BIM means, as you mentioned, BIM stands for Building Information Model or Building Information Modeling. And essentially, what we're talking about is a way of working um, which is tied to a, a type of software that architects and building professionals use. The difference between a BIM software, and there's a few, a big one is Revit, another one is Archicad, who we support and use. Uh, what's the other one that's popular? Light, not Lightworks. There's another one. Vectorworks? Vectorworks. I is think that so. BIM? I think, I think it's BIM. Oh. So there are a few out there, right? The difference between those softwares and other softwares is that in a BIM software program, um, you're creating 2D and 3D elements simultaneously at the same time. So just as an example, right, typically when you work in AutoCAD, I never said there's AutoCAD 3D, but let's just say 2D I mean, AutoCAD. Who uses AutoCAD 3D? Some yeah. people do and... Some geek out shouldn't, there. Shouldn't. Um, typically, when you're drafting 2D in AutoCAD and you have a floor plan, it's just lines, right? Mm -hmm. There's no three-dimensionality to the lines. It's just, it's just what we 2D vector. stuff, right? Then you have a separate program where you do your 3D modeling, like SketchUp, Rhino, V-Ray, not V-Ray, Rhino. What? What? Slow down. I'm talking too fast? Slow down. It's, it's all trying to do a four-minute episode? Hot water. <laughs> um, and whatever other 3D modeling program that you're using. And so the two are very separate, right? Separate softwares, but also, more importantly, the 2D and 3D re representations are totally separate. In BIM, they're combined. So that's one aspect of BIM. So when you draw a wall in a BIM software, that wall exists in 2D because you're working in plan, but it's a 3D element. But it's, but I mean, you could say, okay, well, SketchUp and Rhino is the same thing. Right. You could get either or, right? So the other aspect of BIM, which is maybe is equally important, maybe more so, is that every component in a BIM software has embedded with it a bunch of information. So it's like a smart model 3D object component. So we make a wall in ArchiCAD or Revit, for example. That wall has attributes. It has a thickness to it. It has a material. It probably has even the layers that, 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 uh, that are within the wall. Um, so there's a lot of information embedded within it. And that's why it's BIM, Building Information Model. So the idea the kind of idea behind behind BIM is to take all of the information that exists within a real life building, the materials, the cost, um, how it gets assembled, um, the HVAC, how that moves between the, the structure, all that gets put into a digital model, right? So, so it, it, it's really very inf information centric. And I think the reason too for it is to try and um, simplify having to do the same work in 2D or 3D. That's right? part of it, yeah. Like if you draw a plan in 2D and then you need to build a model, you're going to have to either use that plan or extrude that plan up. Mm -hmm. And in some ways you're repeating some of those tasks a couple of times. Uh, you're doing the work twice in many ways, right? So the, the idea by, uh, with using BIM is that you draw it once and it builds in 2D and in 3D, mm -hmm. so you don't have to go back. Um, yeah, I think there's two ways to look at the benefits, which we'll go through as people list online, the benefits of BIM. There's maybe two ways to split it. The first is, is the benefits from an architect's perspective when you're using it. And that's one of them, like you mentioned, you're, you're kind of being more efficient, let's say, because it's 2D and 3D at once. So other, other benefits, like when you change... Um, a component it changes it's it's one central model that gets updated so all of your sheets your drawing sheets and other representations of that thing get updated automatically it's a small stupid thing but that's like one of the big selling points for architects is hey changes door tag once or this door and it updates all the tags automatically and your sheets automatically your your, your um 
your spec sheets and, and whatever else, right? So you don't have to manually do it on every page. Yeah, and that's true to a certain extent. I feel like still a lot of people use those BIM software with some sort of 2D things and at some point like it doesn't update in certain instances. So mm -hmm. it, it could it could very well work like that, but also it might have its limitation. In reality, a lot of times it's not yeah. as easy. Um, so that's like the architect's perspective, the benefits. The other aspect of it really that's significant for the industry and these industries is the collaboration aspect, right? You're able to do what they call is clash detection, which you are in an ideal world, the same BIM model exists not only within the architecture office that everyone's working from one centralized model, but that model is also being worked on or accessed by all of the consultants, the engineer, the contractor, the HVAC engineers, all those people, right? Mechanical engineers. So everyone like a real building you're seeing in a digital space exactly what's going to be built and you can detect clashes when you have an hvac duct running through it's hitting a wall or a beam or something you know in advance because the model is so much more robust it's 3d and it's very very sophisticated as opposed to if you're working straight in 2d autocad you're relying on the architects and the consultants brain power to be aware of these clash um, issues, which something always gets missed. When well, it's in 3D, it's you, easy to see. Especially if you work on like big buildings, you know, mm -hmm. like you work on an airport or on a tower, there's a lot of different conditions and you might not be able to, you know, either do a detail and look at every single one of them, or, you know, it's just a, an, an anomaly in, in all of the conditions that exist and you might miss it. Yeah, a hundred percent. So as the listener who texted in, mentioned there's benefits clearly when you get to complicated projects because there's too much to keep yeah. track of i mean if you're doing i, I don't know like a, a house that has four walls and it's one story yeah bim would could be could be helpful but the the really serious benefits happen when you have large teams spread across and everyone's like remote let's say um so to further describe bim there are some common other benefits that we had looked up online that everyone talks about in a more clear way than we do. And they, they it's often referred to as a seven, seven dimension type model. So you have your three dimensions, which is clearly the spatial. The fourth dimension that's the benefit of BIM is uh, considered time. The fifth dimension is considered cost. So all these components have a cost related to it. So one of the benefits is you're able to use this model to get cost estimates uh, much sooner and then have a more accurate understanding of the building construction costs sooner. The sixth dimension has to do with procurement applications, and the seventh dimension has to do with operational applications. And the seventh dimension is interesting because basically what we're talking about is once the building gets constructed, the building has a life. And for large structures, civic structures, public structures, there is a the maintenance of that building. And the idea that you have a central digital model that's kind of like the manual almost of this thing allows you to use that in the uh, operational and servicing of the building, right? So those are very clear benefits. And I think what's interesting is maybe getting more to the question is a lot of the benefits that we've mentioned and that are talked about have to do with essentially efficiency, right? It all comes down back to efficiency, relying on a, a greater amount of information that's put into one place so that you can be efficient with X, Y, and Z things. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's totally about efficiency. Mm -hmm. And um, we actually found a couple of things online about BIM that kind of describe it. Um, so the first one says that BIM is important for professionals in construction as it enables smoother workflows, mm -hmm. smarter decision design decisions, and better buildings. I think what's interesting is that, well, first of all, um, uh, if you type into Google, what are the benefits of BIM, you get a lot of this kind of verbiage, which is like very generic. It produces better buildings. That That's a very, it produces better buildings from a numerical standpoint, right? But better buildings as designers means much more than, oh, we built cost effectively and we use less resources, all very important things. I'm not saying they're not important. Um, and, you know, we were able to avoid uh, clash issues in the field. Like, oh, those are all great things. But just to 
The phrase of better buildings, better design and BIM allows for that is just so generic and kind of I have an issue with because it just washes over the complexity of what architecture is meant to be aspiring to be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, and I mean, you know, and the first uh, thing I read said, like, um, it it enables smarter design decisions. Well, more efficient. I mean, what are we talking about here? Like the way the waterproofing is going to work with that window, mm -hmm. or like actually what kind of window should go in the building? <laughs> you know, um, you know, to me, BIM is more of a of a tool, mm -hmm. and uh, in and it's very technical. It has not much to do with creativity because of its limitation in the very different ways that you can use it. Um, so at the end of the day, if you're good at BIM, you're just a good technician. Yeah, and this gets to the listener who reached out saying that they kind of feel sometimes that, it, that it's ruining the industry and they didn't explain, expand on that, but I've had the same thoughts and it's, in the broadest sense, I think being an architect uh, and having the te technical expertise to be an architect has increased. And I think every architect we've ever talked to would agree with that, and every contractor would probably agree with that. Um, building technology has become more complicated. Um, construction document sets are bigger. Building codes are more complicated. Everything's more complicated, right? And BIM, um, you know, it says uh, smoother workflows and things like this, but BIM is also extremely complicated. Like the tool itself is very, very complex and heavy and detailed. And it takes a lot of time and work um, using it to become proficient in it. And so broadly, I think when you have a person who's meant to be first and foremost a creative individual, a person who questions things and questions why things um, are they are, are the way they are, but most of the time is spent focusing on the technical stuff. Like something's got to give. Like there's only so many hours in a day, right? And if 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 more and more time in the day is having to, to be devoted to these technical things, then I do wonder if more and more time is being taken away from the creative aspects and creative thinking behind architecture. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think that's why, you know, offices shouldn't rush into getting into the project into BIM. Um, you know, at the end of the day, BIM is not the place where you're going to experiment and test things out and do like, you know, clay models to kind of understand like what the project should be. You go into BIM and you already have to make decisions very early on about whatever wall you're using and whatever window size and type you're using mm -hmm. and those are decisions that are you're picking the specifications of your project and if you go a few decades back those questions will come after you already had a general idea of what the building would be like mm -hmm. right so and you're right that you know using bim softwares are extremely complex um and and th there is a tendency in trying to get it out you know quickly and therefore maybe there is a premature way into getting into it that's not necessarily um helping the design i mean you know i, I joke often but when i studied architecture in paris my my school was in a, a, a neighborhood that was um kind of redeveloped right mm -hmm. so there's a lot of new contemporary building not the typical parisian style building right fine like why not and we would joke around with classmates that some of those buildings just looked like, you know, the ones you see on the cover of BIM softwares. Yeah. Where it's basically a box with a few random, randomly located windows on them. Yeah. And we're like, oh, okay, well, you know, it looks like someone just started to learn the program, which means they learn how to put walls together, merge them correctly, place a window, pick a color for the window, you know, the window trims and whatever, and that's their building. Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's to say that um, it there is a learning phase into learning that software, but there is also the fact that that software does not challenge your critical brain in any way. Um, in the sense of why are you making this decision? Like you never see a, a pop-up window on Revit or even Archicad that says, are you sure this is the best window for your building? <laughs> <laughs> it should. You know? That'd be pretty funny. It's like, okay, we have five windows in our library. Pick one, you yeah. know? 
Um, that would be fun, right? If there was like little pop-ups once in a while, would be like, hey, are you sure this is good? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of an interesting point because like generally when you design anything, you start with bigger picture decisions yeah. and you become more and more focused and more detailed as you move forward. It's not always the case. Sometimes the, a project can be birthed from a very specific thing, like a very, very specific material, right? And that's fine. Um, because as we, just, as we talk about often, the design process starts kind of from wherever it happens to start with your inspiration. But generally, yeah, when you're working in a BIM software, it forces you to make decisions way too early because, because also the way the, the models created in these spaces, like, how do I say this? So if you're sketching something by hand, or let's say you're working in rhinoceros, right? And you create a massing and, and, and whatnot. You are mentally assigning sp the specific materials and specific um, dimensions and other things and characteristics of the the model of the building in your in your brain as you go along, right? You're you are adding detail in your imagination as you see fit, right? And then you there slowly is, there develop. Is, there is there is layers to your decisions. Right, right. And so there's kind of a, a, a gap between what you're creating physically, like the, uh, not physically, but digitally or whatever, like the actual thing, the actual drawing, the actual model. There's a gap between that and what you're seeing in your, in your mind, right? I'm making a white box, but I'm envisioning it to be, I don't know, having a grid, having to be glass, having to be whatever, right? And it has certain meaning to it. And the thing I've created is empty of that meaning, which allows me to project and to imagine and to be flexible in my thinking. That's one way of working, right? It, it, but what happens is in a BIM software, it, it's the inverse. You have to choose, a lot of cases, am I going to use a wall tool, a roof tool, or a slab tool, or a column? Well, most of the time when you're drawing, yeah, you're drawing walls and slabs and things like this, but it's still very sketchy and, uh, sketchy and loose. You haven't really assigned a specific term to it, right? Mm -hmm. Like one of the things that you first learn as an architecture student is that a wall can be anything, right? And when does a wall become a roof, become a floor? When does it they start to merge? When is a wall no longer a wall, but an inhabitable thick poche space or whatever? A lot of that freedom um, disappears if you're not careful when you're working in BIM because you're you it, it's wall. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, it's and, predefined and, and wall. That, and that goes back to the idea of efficiency, right? Mm. Within efficiency, there is the uh, implied notion of speed, right? Of course. Um, and, and 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 the way you like crank out construction documents is not the same thing as it's not the same speed at which you're gonna come up with the best design idea for your building, right? Yes. And I think thinking about efficiency in terms of creative efficiency there are almost two words that don't work together. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I think BIM is great once you know what you're doing. Um, but, you know, as far as a, a tool too creative to design, mm -hmm. to explore, um, I, I, I don't think that's a good thing. It's, it, uh, it, it's because it's, it's forcing you to limit your thinking to the components that the BIM software has to offer. Yeah. That's the other difference too. Like when you're creating something in, uh, from scratch in space, in, in, in rhino space, right? And you have shapes, but they're just shapes. And you assign the meaning to the shapes in your brain, right? It's the inverse in BIM. The, the program is telling you what the shapes are. And you have to somehow work against them to imagine what they, how they could be different. And so you are designing from a set catalog mm -hmm. that the Revit experts and coders, computer people created who they think they understand architecture, right? And that's deeply problematic. Um, now, well, what about this idea that a BIM component could is flexible, right? You could make the wall and BIM be whatever dimension, whatever thickness, be tilted, be this, or that, and be any material, be whatever composition. Yes, that exists, but I'm talking more about in terms of process, right? It takes a lot of work to take a standard component in a BIM software and then make it custom to what you think it is. And because of the the the, the design process and, and thinking, the workflow, it's hard to design that way, which gets what you're saying. It's, it's more like, well, if I know what it is, then I can make the program become that thing rather than 
well, trying to work through the program to, to get there. But even best case scenario, that's that's the case. But if not, I mean, if you take, I don't know, let's say a small size firm who uses BIM because you know what, everybody's using BIM, so let's mm -hmm. just get into it. Maybe they have a BIM manager, maybe they don't, they can afford it because that, you know, that has a cost. Well, then they're using that software because they kind of have to, right? But then they're not super proficient in it. So their design decisions are going to be made of what they know and how to use this software. Yeah. Which means that the design is going to come out. It's not really going to be theirs. It's going to be what they're able to do with, with it, with yeah. that software. Yeah. And that's where it gets into a very tricky situation is that it's no longer architecture authored by the architect. It's architecture authored somehow by the program. And yeah. it's And it's, you know limitation on how you know how to use it and what it's what it's capable of doing yeah exactly it, it's sort of like you're designing a building with a again predefined uh set of part kit of parts in a way yeah even though the parts are, are flexible they're still categorized because they have to be by their supposed type um so there's a number of things to pick up uh from what you said the first was like the process, when do you start using the BIM software versus not in mm -hmm. a project process? Now, it's different for different people, right? And we've, uh, speaking, so people might be wondering, like, well, why would I listen to you? Well, we've worked in, I've worked in offices and we've we used BIM, used ArchiCAD and used Revit. I've not used the other one that I already forgot the name of, whatever it, it was. It's not that common. Yeah. Um, and so I'm familiar with it, right? Um, some places, they start they, their whole process takes place in that software from concept design all the way to the very end. Other places, they don't really use BIM at all until SD is done, schematic design, and you basically know roughly what the thing is. Or a third is a kind of a hybrid where you will have the BIM model from day one, but it's more like you have your site, your origin point, like all the setup, the setup is there. Yeah. And maybe you start implementing some of your early ideas in there lightly just to test, but you're not actively using the program itself to design. You're not designing in the program. Mm -hmm. I will say that all the places I've experienced a more firsthand work the third route, right? And usually we'd have, if it's a larger office, a person, a BIM manager and a team in the office, and they're dedicated to setting up the model and kind of maintaining the model because these these, these BIM oh pro, yeah they're, it's like they're, they're like kids it's like you, you need, need to, a janitor for a BIM model you really do <laughs> you really do to make sure like it's clean they don't There's crap a spill and, here and there and like you know somebody like left trash in the middle of the hallway here you know it's a lot of it's I mean it's it's literally yeah. a full time job for someone to be managing a, a number of different models in, in the office but um. So uh, the, most offices work in the third way, and that means that for the designers, the core design team, which is always quite small, mostly we're using Revit or another 3D modeling program or CAD to be super flexible in the early phases. And then slowly we start to move into Revit um, kind of over time in very specific ways as to not tamper with the design process. Um, so... The offices who use BIM from day one, it means there's only one of two scenarios, uh, truths with that. Either their designs suck or they're really, really good in that software. They're experts and highly proficient in it. And they probably just do the same types of projects over and over and they got it, you know, nailed down. Possibly. But if Possibly. you do towers, you know, like it's pretty easy. Like you have your whole thing set up. You only have so many details on the exterior of a tower. You have your four plates. You have your, you know, like all of this stuff. But that's for the interior of the tower. I mean, it, it, it really depends on the design quality that you're achieving with with what you're doing. Right? I mean, I'm thinking if you do a custom, uh, custom home. Right. You know, on a I don't know, like a super custom home where every every single thing, like not there is no standard size windows. There is no, you know, like you have complex geometries and multiple roofs and all of that stuff. It's not the same thing as extruding a tower and working with, you know. Yeah, modules. sure. I think that's building typology. I mean, we were talking about this the other day with somebody and <laughs> remarking like you know, single family homes, certain kinds are more complicated than towers. And and you know it, it just there's pros and cons and and challenges and 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 not challenges with both right to most towers like you're saying you just repeat floors 
four through 30 <laughs> and you have one drawing of that same floor plate more or less um but the the point is that you know understanding the the program as a tool that you're using to design i think is a is a very helpful perspective um and when you zoom out even further with this idea of, of the tools that you're using, it gets to this the question of like sketching by hand versus sketching in the computer. People of a certain generation tend to prefer to sketch in by hand because that's the, what they grew up with. And they have more faith in that generally for themselves. But if you were to ask them like, you know, gun to your head, do you think it's better that current generations learn one way or the other? They all say, I think you should learn how to sketch by hand because it's the most efficient. And in terms of tools, it's about having a tool that you're very good at, yes, but the tool itself, the more simple and, and easy to learn it can be, and the more flexible it can be, the better, right? Because it allows you to, to be more imaginative. When the tool gets really complicated and there's a lot of you know, menus and numbers and pop, uh, what are they, pop downs and pop ups and all these crevices and stuff, when the tool gets very, very hairy, it, it, it limits your thinking. And and yes, it's true. If you're an expert in the tool, then you then you're a master of it. You you know you have the the dexterity to use it in whatever way. True, but you know again, drawing with a pencil versus using Revit, that's a massive spread of complexity. And I and I don't know of many architects who are really producing creative work who are experts in Revit, and they know Revit so well that they can use it and be as flexible and as free as they were as using a pencil, right? Like that's a, that's a unrealistic expectation to have of either training architects or architects in the profession. Um, so, so as much as it is about being a master of, your, of, of the tool, some tools are not meant to be used to be in the, in the free thinking mindset. Then in the level of decisions, like you said, you got to pick the window and then you got to put its size and then you got to pick out like you know the detailing and all of that stuff and and you know you might not know right at that moment when you pick that window what you want yeah you yeah. know so it's kind of in some ways it's efficient because like I, like I said you don't have to duplicate the work in some in, in, in instances right like if you some if the window type changes you just change it once it changes everywhere that's pretty awesome you don't have to go through every single window and change it right but in the same time sometimes it's asking you so many questions about one component no, it's exhausting. that it actually takes a long time to get it done mm -hmm. because you do have to think about answering those choices in a way that makes sense yeah that's the other aspect of, of bim softwares that's very um, dangerous is it's very front heavy mm -hmm. um so even when it comes to like billing your clients for the amount of work you do, offices who use BIM softwares tend to bill more earlier. So like uh, more histor historically speaking, construction documentation is the phase where that's a lot of money because it takes a lot of time to produce CDs, it still does. But what happens with BIM softwares is that because you are making so many of the decisions much earlier and throughout that a lot of the f some of the fee that that used to be dedicated to CDs put it gets put back earlier to design development even even before that right because your model has all this information and your drawing set has all of, all this information and it's all set up right uh, through SC and DD and so by the time you get to construction documents there's not as much to do as there was before because you've put all this time and effort earlier to to make sure it's clean to have all the information and and, and whatnot and um it being that front heavy um it's just it, it's a double-edged sword like a hundred percent it's that sometimes i feel like it's a deal with the devil that you're making you know and you know i mean it's great too that you can share that model and have everyone work on it like your consultants the contractor mm -hmm. but also sometimes it doesn't make sense because you feel the only one using it maybe it's not you know depending on the project type maybe it's overkill honestly yeah, project you type, know, yeah. Like, I've worked on projects where we would use BIM and the consultant wouldn't. Yeah. So it actually made our, not, not our life more complicated, but at some point I think we ended up actually modeling the ductwork for them 
because it was just not helpful. You know, and your brain is used to being 3D all the time and they would not yeah. <laughs> give you good drawings too, which wasn't very helpful. Or even if, you know, the contractor that's building the house, it, let's say you have no consultant or like just one, and then the contractor is not using that to do his portion of the work. Well, sometimes it's a higher fee for offices to use BIM mm -hmm. for their clients because mm -hmm. it does take more resources and sometimes a little bit more time in setting up and... And there's an expertise. And an expertise. And it's kind of not a waste, but almost if, you know, at the end of the day, you're the only one using it. The ideal situation is everyone on the team is using BIM. Yeah. Everyone's proficient. The contractor's out on the site and they have an iPad or a laptop and they're swirling around the BIM model looking at like stuff in 3D like you see in the advertisements. Yeah, yeah. And that happens for sure. And for large projects, like we had a friend of who was a, the BIM manager for the uh, LaGuardia <laughs> you know, airport like thing. I'm like, I don't want to see that model. <laughs> I'll go blind after I see it. I know it's something will happen to me once I see it. Um, so for really large stuff, like it's essential almost, right? And it makes a lot of sense. But th for the average practice, whatever that means, architecture practice, um, it, we're not there yet as a profession wide. Like we're not at that point where everyone is using BIM and in and, uh, and architecture and the other professions and it's as smooth and as easy as it you would hope it to be. It it's and there there's some um, some reasons for that that it doesn't have to do with people who are not willing to learn new things, which is a bummer. And there's also some valid reasons of right now the software's it's they're just they're super complicated. I mean I you know I don't want to talk about education too much because I know you're sick of it, but, but like students who ask like, oh, should I learn Revit in school and like try to, you know, design my third year project in Revit? I'm like, are you fucking mental? Like, the, and the <laughs> teachers who say, oh, you got to learn Revit because like when you go trying to get a job, all the offices use Revit and they want to know if you know Revit. I'm like, okay, teacher, professor, who's like 70, have you ever opened a fucking computer and used SketchUp, let alone <laughs> Revit? Oh, no, but you know, well then shut up. Because you don't know what you're talking about. Revit is so unbelievably complicated. You put that on a third year student, you condemn them to never learning how to design. Fuck off. <laughs> no, I mean, that's something that really bothers me is people like start professing, you always oh, do this, do that because you're going to get hired. Have you used these tools? No, you haven't. So what would you know anything about what it's like to learn design through these tools? Right? Oh, no, you don't know. <laughs> that's my rant. No, oh, no, that's I, my I, rant I, for the I, recording. Well, and that's true. I mean, those those programs take a lot of time to learn. Also, if you're learning in school, it's not really gonna be the way you're gonna use it in no, an office, not. honestly. So it's gonna take a while to learn, and that shouldn't take over the time that you would need to actually learn on how to design. That's my guess. I actually learned ARCHICAD on my fifth year. Yeah. <laughs> And decided to do my thesis on it, yeah. <laughs> using it, yeah. <laughs> which I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> but well, um, I did an internship that was actually using the, the software, so I, I got to learn it a little bit. And uh, I was like, well, you know what, I'm actually pr familiar enough with it that I can figure it out to make my, my thesis project. Well, th and, uh, it, it took some Googling around to figure out how to some do some Some Googling of around, I'm sure. <laughs> it's not like today when you can Google and find an and answer very YouTube quickly. YouTube videos and whatever, but back then it wasn't, it wasn't like that. Well, I will say this, uh, a few things about your story. One, you're a fifth year student. You're not a third year student at that point. Like, you know what you're doing in terms of design. I mean, I took like a parametric class in Archicad in my third year. Yeah. And I was like, cool. I can make a million boxes by just punching a formula. How amazing is that? I know. And I was like, I can design boxes now, you know, make yeah. a little town of little cubes, <laughs> great, <laughs> and have a camera that moves around yeah, them. Yeah. Awesome. But the other thing too is, um, so one, you were a fifth year student. Two, you had some internship experience with the program. Three, ArchidCAD is easier to use in Revit. Oh, I know that 100%. we're supported by them and we don't sound biased, but it's easier to use in I Revit. I learned Revit too in school and uh, yeah. it's, it's too much. It, it's... I'm not I, an engineer, I, okay? I'm a creative. I, <laughs> I wish that we could somehow, you could have like a side-by-side -side between, let's say, I don't want to use hand sketching because it's too easy to kind of pick on, but let's say Rhino versus Revit. If you had to draw or draw a model, a, like a facade in both programs, how much more, probably how much longer it would take to do it in Revit, but also more importantly, how many steps you have to take to do the same operation. 
right? The amount of micro steps you have to do, click here, click here, click here, drop down, punch in this stuff, click it, click it, oh wait, it's not the right type. Okay, gotta go back, choose the right type. The amount of steps you have to take to create the same thing compared to those two programs is so many. And again, it, it chops up your thinking, right? Um, and, and that's a very dangerous thing. The, the other way to look at all this is that the benefits of using BIM and, and maybe, I know we listed a, a bunch al already, but there's a, another list we have here. The benefits of using BIM are always from the how-to perspective and from the perspective of from the outside world, um, so not the architect uh, so much. It's the builders, it's the clients, it's the mechanical engineers, it's everyone else saying like, well, this thing you're going to use is going to be more efficient, smoother, saves money, allows you to more information ahead of time, X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that's from the outside. But what it means to use that in the creative process of creating a, a, a building that's meant to be pushing boundaries of society at the largest sense, like that's perspective that people don't get. And that's where I think it's very important for architects to be mindful of that because it's very easy to get to just get sucked into the 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 benefits that are more f numerical, you know, and more easily quantifiable. Yeah, yeah. As efficiency always is compared to these other things where you're floundering, you're doing stuff that doesn't make sense. What is the wall? What is the roof? Like, you know, but the Revit doesn't care about that. And the people who are so pro BIM and its efficiency, they don't think about that either, right? But that's the seed of architecture. And without that, then you're producing the stuff that's on the cover of, of the BIM, you know, uh, like when you launch a program, there's always a rendering of a building. And it looks like that stuff because it's, I mean, a, 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 a more concise way to put it in, in a sense is that, you know, it, 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 anyone listening, if you've seen one of these kind of BIM tutorials and there's an architect who, <laughs> who shows you how to build a house, build a house, a model a house with full CDs in like three hours, 100% chance it's garbage architecture, right? It's always terrible well, architecture. Well, it is, and also it's 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 a false uh, it's a false tutorial because that person already had made their choices mm -hmm. because they probably did it once and then did it again into a tutorial, right? So already they already know what kind of window they wanted. They already know what material and what shape and what size and of that stuff. They already asked them asked themselves the question once. Yeah. They're not doing it live, like I, I mean. Sometimes they do, but but it, but, but, but at it's the end of the day, it always looks like crap. It, it, one, right? the, I the, mean, the, that particular it went building, gone fine, but yeah. it's not an interesting piece of architecture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the one they produce, and a lot of times I have to say, if you look at their own work, you're like, yeah, it's basically not much better than what you produced in two, three hours. No, you're a good technician. You did it quickly. Great, good. Hundred percent. It's sort of like you know these these cooking um, commercials or kitchen. Uh, like the, the the slap chopper, the Nutribullet commercials, or whatever device commercials where they make a whole like turkey dinner in like an hour and a half or half an hour. It's like yeah, because you got everything set up and cut for you already. It's all prepared, so it's easy to make salsa than like pesto and like whatever well, else. That or it's like a you know American cooking show when they take things that are already made and then assemble it into something and then call it cooking. Wait, like what? I don't know, I'll take a bag of Oreos and like stack them together, <laughs> put some cream and frosting all around and call it a cake. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, no, <laughs> cooking is like, you got to decide what kind of cookies you're making. You're making the cookies from scratch. Right. You're deciding on its shape, on its weight, on its color. and Or like, what kind of cookie. Even, or what you kind know, of cookie, yeah. you know, like if you take something out of the pack, put it together on a plate and throw some mayo on top and cut it a dish. <laughs> May on top. I mean, Goodness. Uh, to me, that's not that's not cooking. <laughs> it sounds that's very assembling. French to me. Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it, it, so if I'm, you're good at assembling, that's one thing. If you're doing at creating something from scratch, that's a very different thing. And yeah, there is nothing wrong with either or. Like you could be really good at, at either or. It's fine. It's just don't confuse them. They're different. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The inventive aspect, like you said, creating a new recipe. I mean, that's what architecture is is it's really like being a chef and you have an expertise and you've done many other recipes before but now you have this one and and it, the the building type would be the equivalent of like okay you're making a cake well 
<laughs> a cake could be anything. You're making a house, a house could be anything. Well, you've made a hundred houses before. Why does it take you so long to make a new house? Because it's a new house. It's a new cake. I don't know what this cake's going to be. And you have the the flexibility to to pull any ingredients you want, right? And to look at those ingredients and to question them and to experiment with them. And it's it's complete experimental freedom in the typical process. BIM is like, it's assigned you specific, quanti specific quantities of very specific ingredients in a certain order and says like, okay, try to like, create something cool with this. And now you have to try and work backwards from it. It's even worse actually than, than what I'm describing because salt is pretty generic, um, but a window is, is hyper specific. And there's that that freedom that just, it's, it's really hard to capture that magic when you're tech forced to be a technician. And then, you know, talking about speed a little bit in, in a different ways, I mean, uh, you know, Revit, for example, is a very slow software. It's heavy. So even if your thought process works at a certain speed, the software might not always follow what you're trying to do. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and there is also a lot of inefficiencies in, in those, you know, in those types of softwares, honestly, because if they run fast, that's great. And if they run slow and they keep crashing and you have to like open the backup model oh and like God. reload everything and re-update everything, well, it's actually a, a freaking headache. I think it's hard for the architect because you are trained and you're interested in both the, the, the big questions and also the technical stuff. Like you like doing both, you know, most architects. And um, I don't know, if you're more the creative type, it's, it's really it's, it's shitty to be like at your desk with your monitor and like looking at this model that's like rotating and it's like loading and then it freezes to the punch in like coordinates or whatever it's like what am i doing with my life here oh. like, and so people might be wondering okay well from a a a a group perspective like i've been talking a lot about the individual architect well i'm an office i have employees i have people i can hire who are bim experts like why can't i just do that you can and you should is my recommendation um but it's like How 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 much are we going to allow the, the 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 design and construction documentation process to be chopped up into pieces and dispersed across different experts before we say, well, um, you know, is it worth the benefits? To be clear, it is worth the benefits, like if you do it correctly, right? Yeah. And that that so maybe something I should say is like I we believe in BIM, we use BIM, it, it makes sense, it's it's good, but it's a very dangerous and powerful tool. Like you have to know how to engage with it properly. And as a general trend, everything in the architecture process has become more and more divided and more split up. You know, I, I, I do feel that before the thinking, designing, and technical solving even were happening more fluidly in, in one short period of time by one person's hand, um, even especially when you're talking about physical, physical production, drafting by hand, sketching by hand, physical model making, you're thinking about a lot of stuff at once and when the tools become more complicated it's force it, it things are split so now it's instead of like okay instead of being efficient by thinking more heavily while you're doing something it's more like okay just person over there turn out five options for me then we'll have a critic critique session i look at it okay now do another five options for me and that person who's producing the five options even if it's in rhino right they're more like a a technician a design technician in producing out stuff so instead of like critiquing as you're going and being thoughtful, it's like, okay, just produce. Okay, let's sit. Now we'll be thoughtful for 10 minutes. Now just go produce and come back to me, the partner, and I'll be thoughtful. And everything's kind of split up that way. And this happens in larger offices uh, more so than small ones. And BIM can exacerbate that issue, um, I think, totally, right? Yeah, and I think it was so standardized um, the way the design approach uh, has to be especially in bigger offices, right? Mm. If everybody's proficient in this software, therefore that's what we should all use right now for this phase, you know? Versus maybe, I don't know if you're in a small office that uses it, but you're like, hey, you know what? I'm the only person on this project. I would rather like do it around on my notepad or like play with my iPad and like sketch things out before I touch this thing. If you're part of a team, you work on a big building, you're like one of the five people designing that thing. Nobody's asking you what you're thinking. Like it's kind of like the standard has been established and everybody has to follow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's a, you know that's kind of another 
thing that I think using BIM is also shifting the office cultures and mentalities and even the, the, the process or the freedom of the process and how people engage in the mm -hmm. office in the process. It's less fluid, you mean? Yeah, it's more, you know, everybody's expected to do the same thing, oh, I um, see. you know, a lot of times. Or you have deliverables, like you say, you have to have four, three options and they need to be done in like Rhino or Revit or whatever, you know, depending on the office. If the office is open-minded enough, then maybe you don't have to, but, you know, there is a standard presentation that you've been showing clients. You have to kind of like stick with that thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think the standardization of architecture i mean standardization as a concept in general is is something that like architects i think should always try and avoid in a certain way right yeah. standardization of process standardization of of, of approach uh, of thinking of components of materials of just everything right um, it's like the opposite of what we were trying to do in in the greatest sense and you know, a lot of the BIM programs, it, it is really about, again, hyper-efficiency through standardization in a certain certain way. And also through just information, like a more and more information. And so I'll, I'll get to information in a second. But so standardization, and it's kind of interesting because you'd think like, well, you know, there are really inventive architecture offices that use these programs and they, they use other computer programs that are also very sophisticated. I'm thinking specifically of like offices that tend to do a bunch of very curvilinear work that is generated by parametric programs and scripts and, and whatnot, right? Like there's a great example. Like Grasshopper, Maya. Yeah. They're, okay. Well, there's a great example of architects leveraging that software to do something unique and they've never done before, right? And that the, the, the tool and the architect go in hand in hand, right? It's not the master architect just using the tool to express their ideas. They're, the program is allowing them to find new ideas. True, that happens. And that's a good way to engage with a tool. And uh, the, 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 that, is a, a creative, that is a creative tool. But it's, BIM, fun, but it's funny though, because a lot of those types of design kind of all look the same. Okay, that's a different issue. <laughs> um, that's a different issue. I know, but you know. So, but that's a creative tool. BIM is not a creative tool. It was not designed or created to be a creative tool. And the people who make it are not trying to create something that's going to allow you to have more paintbrushes to work with, right? I say there are some softwares that try more to do that, and they're therefore better than other softwares. But generally, BIM software in quotes, that's not the point of it. And so I know we focus heavily on design, but, I, but my, you know, this person says it's ruining the industry. My biggest beef, and the first thing I think of, is more to do with design. Yeah, I mean, again, it, you know, like, like I said, having experienced those like BM designed building in real life in that neighborhood near my school, I can tell you these are awful. So I don't care what program they were in. At the end of the day, is what does the building looks like and yeah. the quality of the architecture, and you know. <laughs> That's what's most important. Yeah. You know, like the efficiency, yes, that's great. And that's great for what? For money, for the client, for mistakes, to like seeing mistakes in advance before they happen, like trying to to do better, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, the outcome and the goal should always be to produce good architecture mm -hmm. in the sense of the, well, its quality. Well, see, that's an interesting thing, too. Like I said earlier at the beginning of the recording, they say it produces better buildings, good architecture. It's good that better design happens through BIM. See, design is a tricky word because it could be interpreted in many different ways, but it is not better in the, the, the conceptual sense that you're describing, right? Um, the other aspect of BIM that I think is interesting is obviously it's, it's heavily information-focused and reliant. Uh, information is in the title of it. And it's all about information. And we are in the information age. We have been mm -hmm. for a bit of time. And there's a b general belief that the more information about whatever thing, the more we can dissect it and have all the stats about it, the the better for whatever purposes. And um, it's, uh, I think information will, uh, for in regards to architecture and what we're talking about, will will help us solve certain things um, more quickly and more consistently. But it, it's not. 
it's it, it's, it, it's 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 without it's without direction uh right. yeah and again i mean to me it's like when you walk down the street the building that you're going to be the liking the most or the one you're going to remember is not because uh I don't know, it has taken like, you know, five hours to build on a software. Mm. It's because of its character. It's because the way it's been designed, you know, it's because of what it is and at the end as a as an end product, right? Yeah. That's, it, it's not, it's not actually the, the thing that makes it that you remember it or you like it is has nothing to do with numbers or information. It's purely an emotional personal physical response to that piece of of the city that you're walking by mm -hmm. you know and i think like you said i think that's where using all of those sophisticated programs and and putting importance and priorities on those things in the society we're in right now is kind of a slippery slope because everything becomes emotionless and soulless in some ways right mm -hmm. it's we're talking with numbers that we can all understand but what is there behind those numbers? I mean, efficiency is a good thing. Like, and we need more, as we talked about before, lowercase a architecture, baseline good yeah, architecture yeah, yeah. everywhere. Um, but it, when you introduce th these, again, complex tools into a office at the scale of one person and the scale of a 20 people office or even 50 people office, it's a very dangerous, it, it'll completely change the dynamic of an office easily. And potentially even the quality of the work the office is producing at the at the ground level, yeah, yeah. you know, at the the, the, the the people who are actually designing the work, not the partners who come in and critique stuff. It'll completely shift things overnight, like very quickly. And it's 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 a tough thing too because we're still at the uh, at the phase where again Re um, Revit is not and BIM is not the majority. I don't believe not by far. Uh, last I checked, and a lot of the partners are. You know, they're from a generation where they didn't use computers at all in school, like zero computers. So it's it's this disconnect between the tools that all the people in the office who are producing the actual work are using and the partners. And I just see it as being, I, I mean, at, at some point, you know, it is what it is, but it, it is very concerning and very dangerous. Um that happens to be also where education highlights these issues mm -hmm. in school settings. But I think offices should be viewed as a school setting and as an educational setting anyway. And um, it's just tough. It's it's like it's sort of <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is that the right comparison? But it's kind of like Game of Thrones, and you have like you're trying to find your your advisor, and you've chosen like the Red Witch. Right. And she has like all these promises that she's going to give you as the Red Witch. But like you don't really understand the cost that it's going to, 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 to have potentially. And you won't understand it from a partner's perspective, probably because you're too far from it. You're you're not in the trenches. You don't use the softwares. You, you don't have you probably don't have employees talking about it the way we're talking about it, because who has the time and space to do that in an office. Right. Uh, it's 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 an odd it's an odd thing, and maybe the gap. And this is. And, and, I mean, even those partners who don't use these technologies, they're often amazed by how, you know, all oh, those young kids they could build those things in this complicated software, and they don't think about it as like, wow, the design that we're producing is actually like a much higher quality level or a much more interesting design. Mm. No, it's like, oh, they're capable of using this complicated software and show me the building the way I, I designed it and I envisioned it. Mm -hmm. And that tells you that, again, it's mostly used as a technician software rather than like a creation software. That's a great summary. And and we have to think from even a, a more distant perspective of the entire profession in its current state and adopting these, soft, these programs and these tools, but more importantly, the future of the profession, right? Because... You just, you know, all these people who never had to use these softwares and they're leading the offices and a lot of offices still function in a less democratic way where it's the head partner. Mm -hmm. It has a heavy hand in the design of things as they probably should. But once they disappear, what percentage of practicing architects who are the true architect in that they're doing a little bit of everything 
our 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 their their ability to to create and question is hindered or greatly defined by these complex tools that some third party company created. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that then they were been then bought by like Autodesk. Like, what what does that mean uh, for twenty years from now? Do I mean you know? Fortunately, we assume that softwares are going to evolve uh, and become more easy to use, but um, you know. <laughs> There's a generation of people who are becoming more like technicians out of necessity because they have to learn it to get hired. They have to do it in the office because it's expected of them because the office can't afford to have three full-time technology um, experts who manage their BIM models, right? So the employees have to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're 25 to 30, right? What does that do to someone after that period of time when they go on and have their own practice? Like, that's the real big question. And as much as it's easy to say, well, that's, that's what's going to happen, so we just have to deal with it, fine. But I think questioning and thinking about these things is still super important. Um, so I, I guess the sort of actionable takeaway is that if you're an office owner um, and you think of introducing BIM, um, just be aware of these issues and, and, uh, understand it almost be good for like a partner to just at least get, give a shot and try to design a building in BIM or watch it in real time. And, and then for them to realize more viscerally and immediately, okay, this is what, this is the, the process now in my office. Do I like this? Do you want the people who are in my office who I'm grooming to take it over to have to work with this thing so intensely. Do I like this idea? Because I'm training them. They're they're being trained. That's always part of it. Or do I not like it? Uh, or do I say, well, I've got to use it, but we have to figure out a way to, to use it uh, so that I still make sure we're, we're valuing design in the architectural sense, mm -hmm. you know, and we're yeah. not sacrificing it. It's a super important question. Yeah. And I think also there is probably a tendency for, let's say, small offices to move into using BIM because they're getting more project, they're getting bigger, they have more employee, and which is great. I mean, if the goal is for the office to become bigger and make more money, that's fine. But at the end of the day, you're just turning into this machine producing architecture and, you know, like this money making machine, which I'm, I'm not saying that architecture shouldn't be <laughs> a money making machine. Like every business should be in some ways, like you, you, you work because you want to make money. But also that should not devalue uh, what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, or you shouldn't be losing the the, the, the vision goal. or the goal of why you started it. Um, that's kind of like the, the danger, I think, um, mm -hmm. in using those technologies. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's just, just focusing on the efficiency, just cranking out more work, doing more models, like getting more buildings out there and kind of forgetting why you got into making buildings and what is the bigger purpose of us making buildings i sometimes feel like because architects are are trapped in this in between space of again the creative and the technical and the the um the you know it's an art and a science and these kinds of split like we're like smack between there and yeah. and by definition that's where we exist and we cannot escape it and if architecture can be in understood in both of those ways, because it is both sets simultaneously, I think it's sort of important to think about everyone in the world, how do they think of architects mostly in casual conversation, but also what are they willing to pay architects for gen mostly? Um, and do they think of them mostly as the artist or mostly as a technical kind of person? Because that perception that everyone else has is important. Because mm -hmm. if we say, and we know, well, architecture has to be 50-50. It's both. Same time, equally. It's the same, same at both times and equally. But everyone else, 90%, let's say, perceive architecture as being mostly just technical and about resource efficiency and just, you know clash detection and whatever other things, right? CDs, perma drawings, whatever. If the majority of people view architecture that way that is architecture's response architect's responsibility to push back from the other direction right 
And inversely, if for some reason everyone thought of architects as being just these artists who just produce beautiful things, um, then it would be up to the profession probably to push back and say, well, no, there's actually very serious technical stuff that we do as well that's very important that we bring to the table and we're not just an artist. Because we exist in the context of, of, of everyone else and that's that's the responsibility of the profession is to find that balance. Yep. And I would say that most people view it as more as a, a technical thing. And this ties into other conversations about architects being called architects versus designers, <laughs> which we talked about in other recordings, but it's worthwhile mentioning here real quick for some context. Um, there a lot, I mean, it depends on the region. I mean, we're in California, right? So it's different maybe here versus other places, but it's super common is an understatement uh, to way to describe um, how common it is for people to not think of architects as designers. Architect or designer, you're one or the other, they're not the same thing. That's what people think. 95% of people think, right? In where we are, from what you've seen. Well, shit, what does that mean? <laughs> That's confusing to me. All right, well, as the architect, you're the technical person, you do the facades, you do the exterior stuff, you do the permit drawings, the CDs, you know, you building pricing or whatever they, they think we do engineering too. stuff that's complicated. Complicated and technical. Yeah. You know, and I think as a profession, the more we allow this narrative, this false narrative about, of what architecture is about to continue and to dominate our definition, the worse off we are. And we have our own definition, but guess what? It's totally irrelevant if no one else knows about it and no one else believes in it. Right? Yeah. So that's the other way of looking at all of this is that BIM is one tiny piece of this larger pie, um, but the benefits that are being touted are in the same vein. It's technical stuff. It's the how-to stuff. It's the what stuff. It's the cost stuff. It's the efficiency stuff, right? And uh, I, I just think we need to just, just, the more we can combat that perception about architects, the better, because we're being fucking eaten up by that, that perception. That's who we are in everyone's minds. That's not who we are, right? Um, and that's not why we exist. <clears throat> really quickly, also, you were talking about something having to do with uh, <laughs> what you're saying. Something with like. Is already this someone I'm talking to you? Large, because I'm thinking about what I'm trying to say. La something about large. Um, Oh, you're talking about small offices adopting this technology because they feel like they have to because large offices are doing you it. You know, they want to compete in the same in the same court as the other guys, right? They, they feel like they kind of have to. Yes. Like, how many of them actually want to be using the tool? Probably not very many. Probably not. How many, many of them would rather like do sketch, you know, sketches or even just use CAD for what they do? Probably a lot of them. Mm -hmm. You know. Which I hate. <laughs> I hate CAD. <laughs> Uh, I hate but, CAD, but, but if but, it's something you've been using your whole life, what would you want to switch now? You know, if you're like 50 or whatever, and like, well, because guess what? My competitor is uh, he's using that software and it just like looks better because it's more up to date. Like you look like you're outdated if you sketch by hand or use CAD. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of a complex of inferiority that pushes people to go toward this technology. Mm. Is that I want to be the, the one that everybody's putting fingers at and making fun of, right? Mm -hmm. Which is mm -hmm. kind of sad. In a way. Yeah, no, no, it is. It is sad, and you're you're being for. It's it's not just like you're being forced into wearing a different coat color because everyone's doing it, right? Or I have to wear a white shirt to the office because everyone's wearing a white shirt, you know, which used to be the case back in the day. Or I have to be, <laughs> I have to have a penis because everyone else has a penis. Like that's the way it was like 50 years ago. White shirts and penises. Um, it's not as <laughs> having a penis is complicated, but it's not as simple as wearing a white shirt, right? It's, it? it's, it's, you're changing the, you, know, you have a sex change, you can work in an office, it'd be very complicated, but you're fundamentally changing the chemistry of the office. You're changing the, the, the tools that your people use and the complexity of the tools. It, 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 it changes the, 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 the chemical makeup of stuff, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's a very good point. Like if. You know, you if you're a painter, you've been painting for 40 years with the same types of brushes. You got accommodated to them, you get used to them, you get to know them, you know how they feel, you know how they work, you know how much paint you got to put on them to mm -hmm. make the shape that you want, right? Like, you, you, you have a familiarity with your tool. And out of the blue one day, well, guess what? There is newer brushes. Mm -hmm. Everybody's using them. Yeah. So you're going to take the risk and switching your brushes 
And guess what? Maybe your first paintings with the new brushes are going to look like shit because you got to learn how to use them. And maybe it's going to take you a little bit longer because they're not as fluid as the first ones you had, right? Yeah. And, you know, if you have an office and, and you go through using those new technologies, it takes courage to change maybe something that worked before and use something new, right? And I'm not saying like we shouldn't go toward evolution because I do believe in evolution. Sure. And I do believe that you should, you know, kind of like kick the box once in a while and like try something new and see what happens. But if you have a business and it's working and maybe you're already past a certain age, you've been doing it for a long time, like. Well, I mean, I, I think that all offices should be adopting BIM, actually. But it's just a question of how you do it, right? And 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 again, the perspective of the, like, it's not it's not a a productive mindset to have, and this is not what you were saying, but it's not a productive mindset to say I'm just going to reject the thing because I don't want to do it. Um, that's a very self centered way of looking at it. Like the profession and the industries are moving toward BIM. It's going to happen eventually. Yeah, yeah. And it's up to the people who are adopting it and using it to implement it in a way. Uh, so that the we have better control and understanding of what BIM is, as opposed to just doing it because we have to do it mm -hmm. and it's being forced on our throats because of Autodesk. Like, it's not the right reason to do it. And again, the public perception, which is the one that matters as to the benefits of BIM and, and, and w whatever else that comes with it, all are from one side of, uh, of the argument, right? It's the how, it's the efficiency, all the things mm -hmm. we mentioned about. So you absolutely have to use BIM, but you have to know how to use it and 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 make the conversation around it uh, be so that the, the things that we're bringing up are central because they are central, obviously. What I was going to say with small versus large offices, this, all of this ties into another conversation about a lot of small and medium-sized offices being purchased by larger corporations. And this was something we talk about between ourselves and other offices that we know and a few on the podcast episodes to come out. <laughs> um, and it's kind of a crazy thing and a very scary thing uh, that you'd have all these, a diversity of different offices of smaller sizes and even medium ones of like 60 people that are going to be bought and consumed by whatever multi-thousand personnel office yeah and um, one day elon musk is gonna buy us all so you know. <laughs> but but yeah but he's a, a wild man but you, you, you these themes of standardization i mean that's like yeah you, you know where we're gonna become three corporate architecture offices in the end so that we can all get bids and projects that for 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 that company i mean why didn't that also brings the question of having the monopoly of, on something yeah you know, and yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, if yeah, you look at yeah. the BIM software, there is a couple out there, right? Like there is Revit, Archicad, and that other weird one that one uses. <laughs> right back to works. Um, and you know, it's three. Like you have, you have some choice, but to some extent, there is not a whole lot of choices out there. It's not like you have 15 different companies you could go to, mm -hmm. right? Therefore, those companies have a lot of power on like how they dictate how workflow and what's possible. I know. Um, dictating which workflow. is something that it's crazy when you yeah, think about it really which is something that when you come from a creative industry it's a little bit frightening because it, it takes away your thinking it does i mean think about it like when you're studying to be an architect and you're in school right you have access to whatever what, whatever types of tools you want depending on the school but generally you want to model stuff by hand you want to take a bunch of twigs and rocks and make something which we had to do a uh, foam core 3d modeling thing peter 3d printing wood shot like, whatever you want right to express or just to find yourself to find the project and you go through five years or six years of that and you're like oh this is like dynamic stuff like, yeah and then you get to the profession okay everyone uses this one tool everyone same tool and someone might be listening saying well but back in the day if everyone was sketching and using may lines and chipboard models that's also basically the same tool everyone's using the difference though is that those who were tools were hyper flexible they're undefined things a pen is a tool yeah but it's an uh, you draw a line it could be anything it's totally undefined uh it's not the case with these complicated softwares they're hyper specific and hyper detailed and hyper defined and very inhuman 
when you're working with them. They're very, very inhuman. They're not manageable. Yeah. No. That's right? it. Boom. Yeah. I think we covered it all. We maybe. covered it all. But if you're listening to this, I'd be very curious to know, if you're listening and you have thoughts on BIM, Revit, and all this stuff, let us know what your thoughts are. Also, let us know if the offices that you've worked at or, or you have or, or whatever, how they implement and use BIM. It, the kind of the three ways we described. Mm -hmm. Is it is it the very beginning to the very end? Does they they do all their stuff in Rhino, then they stop cold turkey, then switch to CDs in BIM, or is it a bleeding? Like how does how is it done? Yeah. Um, and if you're a BIM manager, you hate everything we said, then reach out to us. Let us know why you hated it. Hi everyone, thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213-222-6950. 213 <laughs> you can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have, or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching, and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.